much uh, for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, as just was mentioned, um, the, the topic of my talk is uh, why fairness cannot be automated, bridging the gap between EU non-discrimination law and the I. This is a paper that I published um, earlier last year uh, together with Brent Middlestead, who is an ethicist, and with Chris Russell, uh, who is a machine learning expert, and I myself am a lawyer. So the three of us have been working on, on this issue for, for quite a while, and this is one of the pieces that I would like to present. If you are interested in, in, in the analysis, I invite you to just download the paper. It's publicly available um, and, and, and free. Um, I can only give you an overview over the things that we found. So please feel free to, to look at it in more detail. Okay, so let's just start off um, and talk about fairness and AI and why we should actually think a lot about fairness and AI. Um, the reason why we need to do this is actually quite simple. The technology itself gives up that task. Technology works in a way that looks at historical data um, the algorithm is trying to find similarities in those historical data and certain patterns. And based on those patterns, the algorithm is trying to predict what the future will look like. So you look at the past and you try to predict the future in a very simple way. When you do that, because the world is biased, you're always going to inherit some type of bias. This is what we need to think about it in more detail. I'm going to give a couple of examples that really show why we cannot think about algorithms without thinking about bias. Very simple example um, is hiring, for example. Let's just assume you were to hire a professor at Oxford and you wanted to hire the best possible person for that job, what would you tell the algorithm to do? You would feed that algorithm with historical data. You would feed the algorithm with historical data of the last 20, 40, 50, 60 years um, of successful full professors, chair professors at Oxford. You give the algorithm their CVs, their recommendation letters, their grades, um, everything from uh, what, what you have on them available. And you tell that algorithm, Find me similarities. Find me similarities between those brilliant people and ideally create a profile of the perfect professor for Oxford. It creates that profile, it finds those patterns, and then a new person will apply and you will match that new person against that profile. And if the new person looks like that old person, you will invite them to a job interview. You give them the job, you give them the promotion. If they don't look like that, you're going to filter them out. But... Obviously, if you look at hiring patterns at Oxford of the last 20, 40, 50, 60 years, you will understand that the majority of people have been hired are old white men. So the majority of us will not be hired. And that is true for all types of decision making. It's not just true for hiring, it's true for every type of decision making because there is no such thing as neutral data. And I'm gonna show you a couple of examples that really um, sadly show how pervasive bias actually is in our society. So let's talk about grades. Um, think about how often we actually use grades to decide if somebody should get a fellowship, a job, get to grad school. I think many of us will agree, of course, when you talk about grades, there's a subjective element to it. But what about math grades? You could make an argument that math is fair. Two and two is four. Right? There's not much room for interpretation, actually. So if you're using math grades to decide if somebody should get a job or a fellowship or should be a mentoring university, you could say this as fair. What you might not know is that it's not. Um, there is interesting research that shows that teachers in high school and middle schools assess the mathematical abilities of boys more favorably than girls, even though their abilities are the same, sometimes even higher. They give them more encouragement to take up STEM subjects. They get, uh, girls get less mentorship. So actually their grades are getting down even though their potential and their capabilities are just as good as those as boys. That bias and gender bias travels with women up until to university where male students assess their female counterparts as less qualified even though they're just as strong. Same bias is then met in, um, on the job market. Interesting research shows if you send two batches of identical CVs, one batch has female sounding names on it, one has male sounding names on it, send them to job advertisements. 
the female and male assessors for that job will rank female ability less than the male counterparts, even though the exact same qualifications are listed on the CV. If women are applying for jobs, the reference letters that they hand in also carry gender bias. Women are being described as hardworking or team players. They're never portrayed as trailblazers or geniuses. Those awards are reserved for men. Um, and now you could say, well, okay, where should we intervene? Where should we stop that gender bias? And the very sad truth is that very early on, children already have a very clear notion of what gender roles look like. So by the age of six, if you show children pictures of boys doing cooking and sewing, they will misremember seeing a girl. So that early on, our brains already have a very clear idea of what men and women ought to do in our society. And here's the problem. AI does not know about this. AI doesn't know about the social story behind the data points. And we often don't know about the social story behind those data points. Think about how often you use grades or reference letters or salaries um, to make decisions and how often grades open the doors, for example, to fellowship and jobs, how often reference letters are being used, um, how often you use promotions or salary as a metric for success. Um, but they're not fair. And therefore, this type of bias is carried into the algorithm and the same decision is being made again. In the paper that I'm presenting, we have much more examples. I only want to give another example because unfortunately, as many of you know, um, the bigotry and the, the prejudice is very prevalent. This is an ethnicity problem, but obviously the same problems also occur with ability, occur with sexual orientation, with religion, whatever it might be. Um, in the paper, you see more examples of that. But race and, and, and ethnicity bias also finds their way into algorithm. A similar experiment was conducted uh, with um, CVs being sent out to jobs. Again, one batch with white sounding names, one batch with um, black sounding names. 50% higher callback rates for white people, even though identical CVs were sent out. Reference letters, again, same patterns as with women, uh, people of color being described as hardworking rather than as you know, uh, of innate talent or geniuses. Interesting is also that during job interviews, um, white people tend to sit further away from black people during job interviews. They give them less time to respond and they end the interview more quickly than with white people, which usually adds to the fact that black people or people of color have less ability to convince the interviewer of their abilities and then they don't get the job. But again, AI doesn't know about that, right? Let's now think about how often we use CVs to admit somebody to education or give them a grant, how often we use salaries to give out loans, mortgages, insurance, what kind of advertisement is being shown of us is based on our income, reference letters open and close doors to housing loans and jobs. We think that those criteria are fair, but they're not. And the problem is AI doesn't know about this at all. And we'll just see as objective and therefore make the same bad decisions in the future. Therefore, again, the title of the talk, why fairness cannot be automated. But let's look a little bit more in, in, in detail um, in that because the story gets even worse than that. Um, I think if I have learned anything in my work in, in, in uh, uh, trying to figure out how technology is disrupting the legal system, what I've learned is when anybody tells you we already have laws accounting for it, it's usually that they have no idea what they're talking about and haven't actually followed through and don't understand how technology is actually disrupting the law um, and how law is actually powerless what's coming when we're not prepared for what's coming. And I'm going to give two examples that really show a non-discrimination law is unfortunately not equipped to deal with algorithmic bias. To uh, bring it to um, just an overview, I, I know in this room I don't really need to talk about um, the ins and outs of non-discrimination law. So just very quickly, as you know, we have two types of discrimination if we want to um, prevent direct and indirect discrimination. Direct discrimination means I'm treating somebody less favorably based on a protected attribute that they possess. So I'm not giving you the job because of your sexual orientation, your ethnicity, your gender, illegal in most cases. 
more common is indirect discrimination, where you do have a seemingly neutral provision criteria in your practice that is applied to everybody equally. And it just so happens that it poses a particular disadvantage on a protected group. So employment situation, if I'm saying I'm only gonna hire people that are taller than two meters, height is not a protected attribute, but it will have an indirect effect on at least women. So those are the two things. It's a very good framework. It's an excellent framework if you're dealing with humans. It's a very bad framework if you're dealing with discriminatory algorithms. Why is that the case? Because algorithm decision-making and discrimination is much more abstract, unintuitive, and subtle, and much less easy to detect than human discrimination. All the laws that we have in place were designed with a human perpetrator in mind. So all the legal tools that we have to investigate, prevent, and punish discrimination cannot be easily translated onto an algorithm because their motivations, their actions, and their reasons are completely different than humans. And I'm going to give you two examples that show how legal challenges will come up for claimants as well as for judges. One is the need to actually feel discrimination, and the other one is a lack of evidence. So let's start with um, the lack of evidence. Let's go back to a human human sitting setting. What you have is you are in a job situation. You're not getting hired or being fired because you're a woman, because you're black, sexual orientation, or you're in a toxic environment and you see how others being promoted over your head. Bottom line is you feel that something is unfair. You feel injustice and you go to court, you complain. Therefore, the law, because this is how discrimination works, has decided to create a complaint-based system. You feel that something is off and therefore you will complain. So you need to feel that something is off, otherwise you wouldn't complain. Algorithms discriminate behind your back without you actually being aware. So a couple of examples here. You see interesting research from Microsoft Research from 2008 that shows that if you're using their search engine, the way how you use your mouse and how fast you type can give indications on whether you have Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease without you actually being aware of it. Interesting other examples include Amazon that has a pattern that allows their speech recognition software to pick up if you're sick or not, and then they offer you medicine or chicken soup, whatever it might be. So your speech patterns are being analyzed to figure out whether you're ill. Uh, even more dramatic here is Facebook. Facebook can infer your sexual orientation based on the friends you have on Facebook and the groups you join and the things you like without you actually being aware and they offer you things like gay cure advertisements. And even a further step in that direction is Facebook and the most famous infamous um, ProPublica cases that surfaced in 2016, still not resolved just in 2020 you get another round of, of complaints. What Facebook did is they allowed advertisers to exclude um, people based on gender and race from seeing job advertisements and financial services, which is illegal. Um, they did this without the people actually being aware. They inferred their affinities and their, um, their, their ethnicities and, and their gender identities just on their own online behavior without them being aware. So those people actually never saw a job ad. They never saw a housing ad. They never saw financial opportunities. And that is the crucial problem, right? You're looking for a job and the only thing you see is nothing. And you don't know that you have been filtered out. And if you don't know that you have been filtered out, you will never bring a claim. A complaint-based system is powerless if you don't know that injustice has actually happened. And this is the problem with um, digital technologies in general, because it's not just a job advertisement, it's everything that is out there. The whole digital world is tailored to you. It's the tweets you see on Twitter, the posts on Facebook, the prices on Amazon, your search result. Everything is tailored to you. You only see part of the truth. You don't know if somebody else is getting a better or worse offer, and you don't know the things that you don't see. You're running around with blinders, not knowing of the opportunities that you might be robbed of, and you will never bring a complaint. 
So therefore, the law is powerless in that regard. And again, it's not a failing of the law. The law is genius. I'm very proud that we have such a good framework. It's an unfortunate marriage that technology works different than humans, and therefore, we have to be aware of that. The second problem is um, access to, to evidence of discrimination. Um, Again, this has always been a problem to proving that actual discrimination has occurred, but now it's actually um, getting even worse. Let's just, just go back to um, how indirect discrimination is usually assessed. And I told you like the height example, if I tell you I'm only going to hire, if I told people, you as a human being living on this planet will understand that this could have a disadvantage for women. Why? Because you understand humans, you understand how they're being grouped, you know how the social structure actually works. So what is it that you did? Well, you used what we have termed contextual equality. You used your intuition to actually look at the inequality ahead of you. A judge uses common knowledge and facts and convictions to see if something unfair has happened. And that makes a lot of sense because you're dealing with real life cases with humans, with human motivations, um, making human actions that make sense in our universe. It's very often very clear what the social inequality is of a certain case. So you could trust a judge to make the right judgment call because they understand that. So a couple of examples from, from the actual case law. If I was to tell you um, that an employer is banning headscarves from the workplace, you will immediately know that this could be in conflict with freedom of religion. You don't need a lot of data. You don't need the many algorithms. You just understand that this is how we work. You understand the connection between um, headdress and, and freedom of religion. Similar here, if I'm telling you an employer is only giving out social benefits to married couples, you will understand that this could be in conflict um, with prohibitions of discrimination against sexual on, on sexual orientation. Again, not much data needed to understand that that's going on. And if I'm telling you, oh, um, I'm only going to hire people with um, short hair, you will understand that on average, women have longer hair than men. So this could be a discrimination point based on gender, right? Social inequality is immediately apparent. Your gut, your intuition is good enough for that. Again, makes sense if you're after a human, a human with human motivations. An algorithm is interested in very different things when they classify people. They might be interested, for example, in the things that you eat and where you shop. Is there, what does it say about you, what you eat? Does it say anything about you? Does that correlate with sexual orientation, ethnicity, gender, religion? Maybe, maybe not. Can you prove it somehow? Probably not. What about your favorite color? If I'm asking you, is your favorite color green or red or blue? What does it say about you? Does it say anything about you? You know, there was research in the 60s and 70s where people claimed that gay people like green and red more than straight people. Like it's absolutely nonsense, but there was research that was claiming that. So just think about how intuition plays an important role. If I'm asking you a very neutral question, what's your, what's your favorite color? And you don't actually know what it's saying about you. Or what if I'm asking you if you have a dog? You like dogs, right? And that's actually a quite interesting story. Let's just say there's an algorithm here um, that says there's an interesting correlation between people who have dogs um, and being creative. So if you're hiring somebody, you want somebody that has a dog because they're more playful and therefore, you know, come up with better things in life. And this is actually a picture of my brother's dog. Um, her name is Fia and I was very, very jealous for a very long time of my brother who lives in Austria, by the way, who was able to, to get a puppy. Um, I have been trying for years and years and years now and I wasn't able to get a puppy. I live here in the UK. So if somebody asked me if, if they're, you know, if you have a dog, I would say no. You would think maybe that's a weird reason, weird question to ask during a job interview, but maybe you don't think that's a problem. What, what you might not know is that it is almost impossible in the UK to get a dog if you don't own your house. So without fail, almost all landlords will say you cannot have a dog. So in Austria, it's different. Almost everybody can have a dog. It's not a problem at all. But you don't, didn't know about that story. I know about that story because I'm jealous of my brother. 
right? But you're using dog ownership and all of a sudden you have created a proxy for wealth. And wealth always correlates with gender or ethnicity or religion, whatever it might be, but you don't actually know about it. So your intuition might crack down. It could also be that it doesn't correlate with it. You could be in a situation where dog ownership doesn't really correlate with anything, but you creating a new group. All of a sudden, people that have dogs or like dogs don't get loans anymore and not being hired anymore. And dog owners are a new group that don't really find any recognition on discrimination law because they have traditionally not been people that have been discriminated against. And that is a big problem. So next picture, this is Finlay. That's my dog. I got her a month ago. So what have you just learned about me? Oh, she must be rich, right? She must have had her own property, how prosperous. And you would assume, because I just told you the dog story, that she must be, that I must be very wealthy now, have, having my own house after years and years of struggle. No, I don't. I just found a very, very generous uh, landlord that let me have a dog and I'll have one. But the algorithm doesn't know about that. On average, they will still think I'm super rich because I now have a dog and they might actually give me higher prices. And I have no way of actually combating that um, because nobody really cares about the ground truth here. So if you're interested in the whole group problem, new groups and untraditional groups and correlation of groups, I actually wrote another paper on this, uh, which is called affinity profiling and discrimination by association. By association being the idea you are associated with dog ownership and you suffer in consequences. I can go into detail, but just as another example that the law might not be good enough, not because the law is bad, but just because algorithms are interested in different things than humans and that's a problem. So after all those horror stories, and I also wanna talk about some ideas for positive solutions here. Um, in a paper that I just published um, six weeks ago, um, which is called Bias Preservation in Machine Learning and the Legality of Fairness Metrics in the Non-Discrimination Law, I started to explore a couple of um, solutions here. Again, I teamed up with Brent Millerstadt and Chris Russell, um, the three of us who have written the Why Fairness Cannot Be Automated paper. And what we try to do in this paper is to look at the current um, technical fixes that are out there. There are so many bias tests out there um, developed by computer scientists that promise to mitigate bias or detect bias to make sure we're not exacerbating current inequalities. So what we did, again, I'm just going to give you like a two seconds summary of that paper. Again, be very happy for you to to download it. It's publicly available. Um, I don't think anybody has actually looked at the legality question of, of uh, of those fairness tests, but we did. So there are um, 20 fairness tests out there that we have analyzed. Um, 13 of them are probably clashing with European non-discrimination law because they are not developed with legal minds um, on board and they actually do not do the thing that non-discrimination law wants you to do. They're freezing the status quo and making actually things very difficult uh, to detect. They're often developed in the US where the legal system is very, very different. Um, and again, because fairness cannot be alternated, it has to be contextual. Uh, very, very important that choosing a fairness metrics is not a neutral act. Uh, you could actually get into legal trouble um, we argue that 13 out of 20, if you use them in a protected sector that is prone to bias to make decisions about people, it gives rise to prima facie discrimination and therefore it needs to be justified, legally justified. Otherwise you would be liable under uh, non-discrimination law. In the same paper, we actually came up with a checklist that we hope will be helpful for regulators, for civil society, for judges, as well as for um, industry, because the headache of understanding the ethics, the legal component and the CS component, I don't know who can do that really. And it's really, really hard to understand the jungle and the mazes of those frameworks. So we came up with a um, hopefully helpful um, questionnaire that lets you choose the most appropriate fairness metrics based on the jurisdiction that you're in and the and the uh, and the purpose that you're pursuing. Again, very happy for you to have a look or discuss it in the Q&A, but I have to wrap up, so just so you know, um, we, we, we came up with that. One of the problems that we encountered in, in our research is that if you were just to automate 
what humans have been doing, you would actually also make things worse, um, which is the problem with, with non-discrimination law and in general, in order to figure out if something is actually unfair, um, you look at the disadvantaged group, you look at the makeup. So if the majority of the disadvantaged group are being made up of black people or women, you know that something's off and that makes a lot of sense in a human human setting. But if the algorithm is tasked in the same way and we have called that test negative dominance, what could happen is that the algorithm might start to divide and conquer. That means creating little groups that have just enough of a diverse set of people being disadvantaged that you never actually go with a threshold. So in a way you're just firing a couple of men. So the threshold is being you know, pulled down. And that's something that the algorithm could potentially do. This is why it's really important that we not just automate what humans used to do, because it actually might work in a human-human setting, but it might not work when algorithms are doing it. So that begs the question, are bias tests at all possible? And I say yes and no. Um, there are certain things that definitely uh, can be done. What's really important for me is that the tech community really, really needs to work close with the legal community. The idea that you can find a solution between one and zero is completely idiotic. And also not the thing that the law ever wanted. Like fairness cannot be automated. Fairness is flexible. Fairness is changing. Um, fairness is diverse. It's context dependent. So the idea of just give me an 80% threshold, and this is how I'm gonna code it, is something that we should never do. And it is seen as a feature, not a bug. So for tech people to understand that they need to be more open-minded will be important for any type of bias test that we're gonna develop. At the same time, the legal community needs to draw inspiration from technologists, mainly with the examples that I just gave you, right? Intuition might not be good enough in the future anymore, right? Not things will be so easy like a headscarf bar ban where you intuitively know there's something wrong. If I'm telling you I'm giving loans up based on a favorite color, you might need to test whether this correlates with something protected because you got might not be good enough. So you need to marry those two ideas um, and say you need to have consistent assessment, um, which means making sure people don't fall through the cracks, but give legislators and the judiciary enough room for their flexible type of interpretation, because this is what fairness actually wants. If you did that, then I think it's possible. But the question obviously is what kind of fairness test would you be using by that? Anybody who's ever worked uh, with case law of the European Court of Justice will say, well, of course, there is no perfect standard of fairness. Such thing doesn't exist. And that's a good thing. I want to say that, too. However, um, in, the, in the paper where fairness cannot be automated, we actually looked at um, a long list of, of case law. And we found a couple of gold standard suggestions that the Court of Justice said, this is the best way of how you should assess evidence and how you should measure legal and illegal disparity. First, it was mentioned in Seymour Smith, very famous case that you're all familiar with, but in a very long line of other judgments, the court came back to that way of assessing uh, fairness. So our question then was, okay, is there an equivalent in computer science that captures that idea of fairness. And we came up with a test that is called conditional demographic disparity that actually marries those two things together, right? Um, it's very good for heterogeneous discrimination, minority-based um, discrimination, and intersectional discrimination. Exactly that type of discrimination that would fall for the cracks if you just looked at the disadvantaged group and just fire a bunch of white people to make the makeup more diverse. But that type of test would actually surface that um, if you did it. What we are arguing for in, in, in this paper is to say that summary statistics ought to be made public. Um, that you actually know what the outcomes of your tests were, and that you also publish the conditioning criteria, because that's really the thing that we need to have a conversation about. We need to have a conversation on what type of fairness is legally acceptable or normatively acceptable in our society. So you could publish um, statistics that show there's a disparity, you're giving out loans based on salaries, and then you could have a discussion, right? Is it fair to use salaries to give out loans? even though you know about the race and gender pay gap? Or could you say, well, giving out loans to people that are not able to repair them might indebt them even further? Or thirdly, you could have a question of, is there anything else that we could use to assess creditworthiness that is less discriminatory? Right? That's the actual discussion that we really need to have. Technology can only help us 
um, to points where we need to look, but it's never supposed to give us any answers. Um, so the best way to think about the bias tests and the, and the, um, uh, and the summer statistics that we suggest is to think of it as a, as a map, as a treasure map, right? It's there to remove the blinders that intuition leaves you because under diverse data sets and untraditional data sets might not make your alarm bells ring like traditional discrimination cases. So those type of tests will tell you, oh, did you know that the algorithm that you're using currently is not inviting any black people to a job interview? Is this on purpose, question mark? And then you can figure out why it happened and might tweak the criteria, right? That type of test will not tell you anything meaningful in terms of legality. It will not tell you if it's justified, if discrimination is justified. It will not tell you who the comparators are. It will not tell you um, whether something illegal has happened. That's something that judges ought to do. That's something that technology should never be doing. So the way that we think about bias tests is really just to give you a treasure map, an early alarm system that helps you to figure out if you're being fair. And then the human needs to assess if that type of disparity is actually acceptable. So that's our idea for that. We are very excited about the fact um, that um, the, the papers that we've written on, um, on, on, on testing and, and, and bias are being heard around the world. So European Commission, for example, um, as well as the European Parliament have published um, several reports in the past pointing to our research and our on our um, uh, testing methods, which is extremely exciting. Uh, world Economic Forum in 2019 and 20 has um, advocated for, for the tests that we have developed in the research. And most recently, just now in December uh, 2020, yeah, 2020, Amazon has implemented um, the bias test that we have um, developed, which is extremely exciting. So we wrote that paper um, in, in March or so, and Amazon has imp implemented that CDD, so conditional demographic disparity bias test in their SageMaker Clarify bias toolkit that they're now offering to all their uh, customers of Amazon Web Services, which is extremely exciting. So we didn't even know about that. Um, super, super excited to see that it actually has some practical implication there and can hopefully help to rein in bias. So let me just say by saying the main takeaway is if somebody tells you that the law is good enough, be very, very critical, but don't be um, completely desperate because I actually think there are solutions. It's just really important that the siloed disciplines work together. If we do that, then I can, then I think we can actually make to start to make less biased decisions and make the world a better place. Thank you.